Hey guys, it's Acorn. Just before we get into the video, I wanted to do a quick disclaimer about some of the audio tears and skips that you might hear in this video. Unfortunately, that is how we got it from Hardy LaBelle's Twitch stream, and there's nothing we can do about that. It's not a problem on our end. This is how we got the raw file. And it happens on some key areas of the discussion, so I understand how it's a little frustrating. Um, but I hope you guys can bear through it. There is still some good stuff in this video. All the maps you're seeing in the background are designed by Hardy LaBelle, as well as some others that obviously I didn't showcase. But I hope you enjoy the gameplay, and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye. Here is hoping that we are live. Hello, viewers. Thanks for joining me. Sorry for the slight delay in getting started. But, of course, with every critical piece of technology, the time when you need it the most, that's the time when it fails. So, <laughs> so I got this thing started, but uh, hopefully it's underway. So welcome aboard, viewers. Um, I would appreciate it if anyone who's watching me could just pop a question in just so that I could check and make sure that the question feedback is working properly. Uh, but luckily, I've got a bunch of questions that have already been sent in by all the good people and all the people on my own a blog and website, so I've got a bunch of stuff to try to answer. So, without a lot of foofara and farting around, let's just get right down to some of these questions. Um, my favorite question, and the one that really cracked me up uh, as I was getting uh, questions from the internet, was why are the maps you designed so bad? <laughs> um, why are the maps you designed so bad? That is a terrific question. Uh, mostly it's because I'm an idiot and I am also a bad person. So that's why. The next question actually frames uh, the, the first question pretty well uh, and, and they actually work together. The, the person who was asking why are the maps so bad actually went through line by line and um, was talking about a lot of the... Um, so let's talk about why are the maps bad and then the second question which is related some people are of the opinion that the reason the maps in Halo CE work well uh, is because of the game's physics and weapon sandbox rather than because the level design is superior. What are your thoughts on this opinion? The person who asked why the, the maps are bad and the, the other person who asked the other question about why do the maps seem to work, the, the two are actually uh, working in concert. Level design is game design. And game design needs level design, uh, largely anyway, you know, depending on the kind of game, I suppose, um, to reinforce each other and to, to make the, uh, the core mechanics and the principles that you are trying to express in the game design work. Your levels actually have to support that. And conversely, as you're thinking about level design, you have to have, um, as you're thinking about level design, you have to have the game mechanics clearly in mind and design around those mechanics. Uh, Shigeru Miyamoto actually told a very interesting story uh, once where he was talking about a, a video game that he was working on. And he said that they started to work on it uh, and they had everything just so. And then as he was playtesting the game, he decided that he thought that maybe the character shouldn't be able to jump quite as far. And I don't know if this was a Mario game or if there's something else that he was working on. And when he told the story, and I heard this first when I was a young designer, it was, uh, it was very uh, profoundly affecting to me because he then said we all started to tear out our hair. The minute I made an adjustment as a level designer, or excuse me, as a game designer to the mechanics of the character, all the levels fell apart, all the gameplay mechanics fell apart, everything really came toppling down. So remember, uh, in answer to the first two questions, why are the levels so bad um, is really because they're simple. They were intended to be simple expressions of concepts that I thought would be interesting tactically um, in terms of the way that the players would move through the space and the, the way that they would use the space. Um, and they're specifically set up so that uh, the amount the, the amount of time that it would take to move through or the amount of time that it would take to move from cover to cover was sort of optimized, the distance of engagement for the weapons. So they are very simple, and I freely admit that. Um, one of the other reasons why they're bad is because I didn't know how to use 3D Studio Max when 
Jason, uh, Jason Jones and Alex Serupian asked us to work on the multiplayer for Halo. And so I actually started to learn 3D Studio Max uh, that day. I basically sat down and kind of camped out with the artists and asked them a bunch of annoying questions. It started to teach myself Max just so that I could build uh, levels in, in the game. And honestly, a lot of the levels that you'll see, they're so uh, geometrically simple and primitive just because I really wasn't that great a modeler. I would do a lot better name of people helping me out or you know just trying to spend more time refining my own skills but as it was with limited resources they were very Let's put it that way okay um next question do i think that the height variation in halo combat evolved maps sets the gameplay apart uh and why is it fading in recent halos that's a great question um you have accidentally tapped into kind of a religious dispute among game developers and level designers in first person shooters. Um, old school designers like me believed that verticality was important. Um, because you were dealing with a space that was truly three dimensional, the idea of, of, of making a space interesting vertically as well as horizontally was something that we really wanted to try to strive for. Um, later generations of game developers have kind of come along, and, and I've heard it kind of over beers and at conferences and stuff, where people talk about the fact that they hate to look up and down in a first-person shooter. And interestingly enough, those designers uh, are supported strongly by the level artists who also really don't want the player looking up and down because the levels are designed to look beautiful from the side, but they're not necessarily designed to look great, you know, up and down, or at least not as much. Um, so the answer, you know, is does the vertical stuff set them apart? To a certain extent, yes. Um, I think the vertical, you know, the looking up and down is, for me, very interesting. And the idea of a space that has a strong vertical element is uh, is really worthwhile, but I really think it's fallen out of favor with a lot of first-person shooter designers and level designers now, um, in favor of you know much more easily accessible sort of horizontal, simplified, vertically simplified maps. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, also, by the way, um, Battle into Camp Two. Uh, the the not necessarily big fan of vertical components, which is why I'm interested or was interested to see that there are some almost platform style levels in some of the raids and Destiny. I'm not a Destiny player. I really don't know much about that game, um, but uh, I was very interested to see that there was some you know some vertical stuff and some jumping stuff. So maybe they're you know slowly coming around. I'm not sure. But in any case, uh, let's move on to the next question. All right. Uh, in your blogs, you've emphasized subtraction as a useful design tool. What's the biggest thing you had to subtract from Halo CE before release, and how did it affect the finished game? Ha <laughs> ha, great question. <laughs> you know that map, boarding action, that sucks so bad? Yeah, well, all right, so the reason it stinks, and I freely admit that it stinks, I can own up to the fact that it is not good, and that's because we had jetpacks. Uh, Chris Butcher had a working model of jetpacks in Halo CE, and they were so cool. I mean, they were awesome. And the whole boarding action map was designed so that every player would start with jetpacks, and then, you know, the timer would go off, and you see these, you know, Spartans shooting across the gap between the battleships, and you see sniper fire going back and forth, and you were trying to attack the other ship. Well, when jetpacks were officially cut, um, simply because, you know, they decided that it was too risky to try to use them in a single-player campaign, you know, and try, and try to support them, uh, that trickled the game, obviously, right, because that, and uh, the map trying to work against was a certain number of small, medium, and large maps just to support, you know, a variety of numbers of, of players, um, and so since it was one of the, I, th I think I called that a medium map, I did this, in retrospect, totally retarded 
scheme where, you know, instead of, uh, you know, in, instead of it just being you jump straight across the gap with the um, with the with the jetpacks, you're supposed to I don't know work your way up across some weird X shape so that you can get to the teleporter that takes you across. It was it was terrible. I apologize. Uh, the jetpacks made that map cool. My fix, which was fast and dirty, uh, really never worked, and so that level was underserved. Funny story about that level. Um, we had a freelance artist that was working with us. I, I just have to tell this because it's so funny. <laughs> so we had a freelance artist working with us who was very strange guy, very difficult to get along with. And ultimately he was so hard to work with that we, we let him go. Um, and Chris Carney, when he came on board, was looking at the assets and he called me over to his desk at one point and said, hey, Hardy, uh, it just, this is supposed to be here. And what that freelance artist had done was he made some of the polys across the bottom of the uh, the boarding action map no collide so that the player could walk right through them. And if you happen to walk through that secret section of the map, he built a little tiny room that had pictures of his girlfriend on every wall. And <laughs> it was like a little shrine to this crazy freelancer guy's girlfriend <laughs> so chris said uh do you do you want to keep that and i said no absolutely not <laughs> we gotta we gotta yank it out as it turns out the pictures were incredibly high res so we got a big savings on the memory footprint for that map simply by removing the high res picture okay uh next question why was the energy sword not usable by spark okay quite a few questions about weapons in the game. Why was this included? Why was that not included? Uh, the fact of the matter is that the Halo tools were so flexible that an awful lot of people on the team tried their very best to get different guns into the game. They would spend time on their own to take models, they would change the colors on the textures, or do even read texturing jobs themselves and then hack into the data to create all sorts of crazy effects, including the sword. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the sword came up as one of these skunk works projects and Jason really fell in love with it. I, th I think he, he, he really liked it. Um, but it was just too, I don't know, too risky and weird to try to support it for the player in, you know, in the very first version of the game. It, he really wanted it to be strong and trying to fit it into the matrix of, you know, kind of where it fell into the balance was difficult. So anyway, the sword didn't make the cut for the first game. Um, as, as you guys know, I've talked about subtraction in my blogs. I hope you know. Anyway, if you, if you uh, haven't read my blogs, please do. There's so much good stuff there. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that was subtracted, and it was something that we chose not to focus on for the um, for the shipping version of CE. And of course, you know, it showed up in later games. Um, okay, next question. Great question. For all the maps that you took part in, and I'm assuming this is just for Halo's uh, Combat Evolved, uh, would you make any changes to any of them today? Yes. Let me tell you. Um, one of the changes I most regret making in my entire development career was on Sidewinder. Um, <laughs> Sidewinder originally started as the concept that there were three paths. My concept was that there were three paths from one base to the other, and it would take the same amount of time to go from one base to the other. You could run through the tubes in the middle, or you could take a vehicle from one base to the other, or you could run around the outer ring from one base to the other. And the teleporter chain, um, literally completely around the top edge into the top level of the other base. So if you ran upstairs in your own base and into the teleporter, you could go bloop into that little thing and then bloop the next thing and then bloop into their base. And it was really cool. Well, one day our lead tester, who was a guy who worked with us on uh, at Bungie West, came to me and he was just super frustrated. He's like, it's too hard to hold the base. I hate the fact that the teleporter, you know, leads you right into the base. Now, the reason that was important is because, much to my regret, I, I learned afterwards, 
you know, you, we've all seen it. Somebody takes the warthog and they jam it into the bottom of the thing so that no one can get in and it, oh, it's awful, awful. But I didn't even think of that at the time. My goal was to try to support these three paths. Anyway, um, so he convinced me to make the change so that the teleporter chain did not lead to the top of the other base. And it completely broke the map. It completely ruined it and turned it into, uh, you know, that horrible thing where people jam their vehicles in the base and uh, just awful. Anyway, I it, that's a change that I regret making. And it was one of those changes where the testers will come to you at the 11th hour and say, you really should do this thing. And I was so tired and... I don't know, just frazzled that I, I listened. <laughs> I shouldn't have listened. My mistake, my mistake. Okay, let's keep going. Um, what do you think were the factors that led to Combat Evolve having the best multiplayer maps in the franchise? I, I would go back to the very first point that I made. Uh, I worked on and also the ones that I consulted on was to be sure that the level design and, and game mechanics were as well integrated as they possibly could be so that the matrix of weapons in Halo were open areas, closed areas, there were straightaways, there were curves. Uh, that, was, that was really my goal. Also, honestly, um, I think you guys, hopefully, you know, some of the people that are out there have, have heard me talk about this before. My philosophy with game design on Halo was I wanted to make a a party game with shooter mechanics. That was really what I thought was cool. The idea that, hey, here's this console that's sitting in your living room. You can hang out with your friends and play something that is as, as accessible and fun as a party game, but you're, you know, you're using guns. Uh, so anyhow, uh, Fugitive Soldier, appreciate that. And trying to make super complicated uh, first-person shooter maps. I was trying to make maps that really express the mechanics of the game. Uh, it also makes stuff that was very accessible. That I have another question about, you know, um, your maps were very, some of the, you know, easy, you know, easy maps, absolutely, by design. And that was the, that was the whole idea. Um, okay, here's another great question. Uh, since a large part of how a player moves through a space is via visual cues, um, how do I feel about the visual design and how that's impacted level design? So that's that's a terrific question. Um, as an old school designer, uh, you know, and I, I, I feel free, feel comfortable calling myself that, um, I have a lot of really kind of foundational ideas about the things that you need to do to make a space readable and accessible for the player. And so those are the things that, um, you know, are, are, they're just so critical to the, you know, usability trumps beauty. Let's, let's put it that way. Uh, making sure that it's, that it's highly usable. And so I honestly get lost in modern maps, not only because I don't, you know, play them as often, but as graphical fidelity has improved and things have gotten better on maps, just visually, you know, the shaders and the HDR lighting and all that other cool stuff, it can be so hard to find your way around, especially when the art team is showing off and really trying to make it as, as visually as beautiful as they can. So for me, I, you know, I come from the old school that believes that, you know, form needs to trump, a function needs to trump form. Um, it needs to drive form. And, and the visual fidelity is, can be very difficult, you know, for, for map design. There's no question about it. Um, I, it's difficult for me to imagine a way to go back once you establish a level of graphical fidelity. It's hard to take that away from the artist and say, yeah, no, sorry, you, you can't make the maps look as good as you want them to look. <laughs> you don't like that very much. But um, I, you know, solving for that problem is, is very complex. There's no question. Uh, all right, let me see here. I got an, an interesting question. Who do I think is the most talented multiplayer level designer uh and who inspires me the most okay um who this is going to sound horrible but I, i'll be frank whoever designed the original dust level on counter-strike is my hero uh as far as i'm concerned dust still is probably one of the most perfect multiplayer level designs ever done, ever created. It was 
just spectacularly elegant and was an, a real inspiration for me in my level design process. The original Dust just still rocks my world. Um, and as a follow-on for that, uh, and here's what's sad, I don't know who designed that level. I'm not, I don't even know. I don't think I want to know, honestly. I want to just think of it as this mythic object that is perfect and beautiful. But um, who inspires me in terms of level design? No question, Valve. Um, for my money, Valve are still the absolute best level designers I've ever experienced or played, bar none. Uh, there, there are levels in Half-Life 2 that literally brought me to my knees. Literally. I was sitting there playing the game and I was just like, oh my god, I can't believe the beautiful things that they're, that they're doing in this level. It's just amazing. So, Valve, best bar none. They are my inspiration. I think of those guys as super geniuses. Oh no, my stream is dropping. Is that true? Oh, right. All right, well, I hope it's... No, I, I apologize, everybody. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, I promise I will do this again, and I will get better connection to my internet um, next time. I, I tried to make it go this time, but I blew it. Um, so many more questions. All right. So here's... With limited time remaining... Um, let me just try to take one more question, and then I'll wrap it up here. Um, okay, here's here's an interesting question uh, that that I that I'd like to answer. It's it's a game design question, but uh, it's it's a particular interesting topic to me, and it's an interesting anecdote. So, this person says, "I have a design theory I'd like your opinion on. I feel that balance is a big deal in competitive games, but it's almost just important to make intentional imbalance in some cases." I learned a fascinating lesson from a tabletop war games designer named Jervis Johnson, who does Warhammer tabletop uh, designs. And his story, which inspired me as far as design, is he said, you don't try to make the armies balance. You try to decide what makes the army scary and then design everything else around their special abilities. And I thought that was genius. Decide what makes them cool first and then make them balanced after. Absolutely, imbalance is critical to making something that's interesting and fun. Okay, since our time is literally just seconds away, let me just say that I'm, I want to do more. There are so many great questions, and I really appreciate everyone joining me today. I'm going to do more, but please come to my website and join my mailing list uh, so that you get all the latest news and special insider stuff because I'm going to have some big announcements coming out. So please join me there. Thank you so much for joining me today. I apologize for the crappy internet connection, but it'll be better next time. I promise. All right. Good night and thank you.